Um, so permutation order matters. So an example would be if I did something and I switched the order, it would have a totally different outcome. All right. So if I went to use my debit card and I went one, two, three, four, okay, and it let me in and give me money, in, right? But if I put four, three, two, one in, would it give me money? So did the order which put the numbers in matter? Yes. So that would be a permutation. Okay. Telephone numbers are permutations. If not, you could take that seven-digit telephone number, put it in any order, put it into the phone, and you would get that person, which is not the case, correct? Um, license plates are permutations because the order in which your license plate goes, BBF, 5679, whatever, um, would be your license plate, and BFB, 5679, would be someone else's license plate, right? Because order matters to what you have done. Okay? So we're going to look here. The fundamental accounting principle. Consider a task made up of several stages. If the number of choices for the first stage is A, and the number of choices for the second stage is B, and the number of choices for the third stage is C, then the way you can complete the task is A times B times C times however many there are, which sounds really confusing. It won't be in a second. That's just the definition of it. So here, in front of you, you have colors. Remember, we cut them out? You should find them. Okay? And if you have a highlighter, you should use it. So a toy manufacturer makes a wooden toy in three parts. So there are three parts to this toy. The only way you can use the fundamental counting principle is if for those parts, you're only choosing one item for each, okay? So here we have a manufacturer makes a wooden toy in three parts. The part one is the top part, and it comes in red, white, blue, or pink. So can you find the red, white, blue, or pink in front of you? And line them up. And then part two, the middle part, comes in orange, purple, or black. We'll go find those three. Put them together. Orange, purple, or black. And then we have part three, which is yellow or green. So we're going to make a tree diagram to show all the different outcomes of different toys we could get. Okay? Now, a tree diagram sounds like it would look like a tree, which trees look like this. It's more like a horizontal anti-gravity shrub. It like goes sideways. Okay? You guys will try and make it a vertical tree. So I'm hoping that with the letters or the colors in front of you, we stop that from happening. So I want you to take the red, white, blue, and pink and stack them. Most of you already have that, I've looked, but I want you to stack them. Red, white, blue, or pink, the very first part, okay? Don't write this on yours. This, I'm, I'm not actually writing this here. I'm going to erase it. I'm just showing you what you would have in front of you. So in front of you right now, you would have red, white, blue, pink. So in front of you, this is what you have. Don't write this here. This is what you have on paper in front of you. You agree? You have those stacked in front of you? Now, off of the red, we can have a red top, and then we can have a what in the middle? Orange, purple, or black, correct? So now by the red, put the orange and the purple and then the black. Now, technically, we could put the orange, purple, black off the white, off the blue, and off the pink as well, correct? I could take those, move them down, move them down, move them down, and then have the options of part one and part two. Do you agree? Then, say off the orange, I could have what now? Green and yellow. Yeah, so I'm going to put that yellow and that green. And we would technically have one of our options. It would be red, orange, yellow, green, correct? I can move that yellow, green down, and it has red, purple, yellow, green. I can move the yellow, green down, and it has red, black, yellow, green, correct? Then I can take this orange, purple, black, and move it down to the white here. And I could go white, orange, yellow, green, white, purple, yellow, green, white, black, yellow, green. Does that make sense? How you can make that tree diagram go? So we're going to do it over here. 
We're going to actually write the tree diagram out. Now, when you write it out, you have to make sure you have a little bit of space between your four words for part one, because we're going to have arrows off of them, correct? If you put them right on top of each other, you don't have enough arrows to space to do all the arrows, and you'll have to erase everything. So I'm going to go part one along the top, and then I'm going to go red, leave a space, white, leave a space, blue, leave a space, pink. So if I only had one part, I'd have four different toys. Will you agree? If I had one part, I had four different toys, and that's it. Okay. But I don't have one part. I have two parts. So let's say I put my part two. My part two is how many options? Three. So I'm going to have those three papers, right? And then the three papers, the three papers, three papers. So I'm going to have orange. And then part three is how many pieces? Two. Two. Yellow, green off of each one of those, right? So the branches keep going. So that's where we get that horizontal shrub. So tree diagrams are great to see the actual, all the different looking outcomes, right? We have a red, top, orange, middle, yellow, red, orange, green, red, purple, yellow, red, purple, green, and it literally physically shows all the different outcomes, correct? But is it quick if I have like 20 outcomes for the first one, 100 for the middle, and 1,000 for the end? That would be crazy, right? Like trying to draw a tree diagram with all of that. So it's good to see the outcomes. It's good to also prove that the fundamental counting principle works, okay? My goal for you guys is to not just memorize steps. If you're just memorizing steps, you'll be able to do 30% of the test because that's the procedural questions, right? I need you to understand why you do what you do. Also, memorizing steps scares me because if you, if you like, forget one step, you can't do the question, correct? If you understand why you're doing something, you'll never forget how to do the question because you understand why you go from step to step to step to step, and then you don't have to memorize anything. You just know why you're doing what you're doing. So my goal always for you is to understand why you're doing something. And if you don't understand why you're doing something, math is not easy. But if you understand why you're doing something, then you're not trying to just fill things with random things or memorize stuff. Okay? So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 different toys. Correct? So we're going to write that. 24 different colored toys. Now, like I said, there's got to be a better way that you can do this because if we have hundreds of options, a tree diagram is not conducive to not missing something up, right? Like if we don't have big enough paper to be able to do it. So there's the thing called the fundamental counting principle, which we talked about above. If you have different parts that make up a whole item, so here this one has three parts that make up this whole toy, correct? And you choose one item from each of those parts. So if I could choose two colors and make in the middle and make the toy, I can't use the fundamental counting principle. 
I can only use it if I choose one color from each of those parts, right? I'm picking one color to make the head of the toy, one color to make the middle, one color to make the bottom. Yes? And if I'm picking one of each, I can use the fundamental counting principle, which is what we're going to learn right now. If I could pick two colors to make the bottom, I can't use the fundamental counting principle anymore. One from each part. Okay? So, we know we have three parts. So I'm going to put that down. I have the first line, part one. And then the second line is part two of the toy. And then the third line is part three. One, part two, part three. Yeah? Okay, like I said, it's my goal to make you guys actually understand why you're doing what you're doing. Because it makes a big difference if you understand why. Okay? So, how many parts does part one have? How many different parts? Different choices, sorry, I should say. Four, four different choices. So I'm going to put four up here. Does that mean I'm picking all four of them? No, I'm picking one. Every blank means, every blank you write in the fundamental counting principle means I'm picking one out of four, okay? So I'm picking one color out of four. Now this blank, I'm picking one out of how many? Three. Three. This one, I'm picking one out of how many? Two. So this is actually the number of different options. Right? Now, I know the answer is 24, correct? Because we just did it in the tree diagram. How can I use 4, 3, and 2? What mathematically can I do with them? Yeah. Multiply. Now, multiplying them gets 24, which is true. But why do I multiply? This is the key thing. If I use the word and, I'm always going to multiply. If I use the word or, I'm going to add. Now, how do I remember that? I think and and add sound very similar, correct? Do you think and and add would be together, but they're actually not? So and can't go, you can't add when you use the word and. You multiply, and or you add. Now, why am I using and? Well, do I need part one and part two and part three to make the whole toy? Yeah, because if I use or, I could have part one. I could just have the head, and I could say, here's a toy. It's a creepy toy. It's not what they wanted. They wanted... One from part one and one from part two and one from part three. So we always multiply. That's why the fundamental counting principle is always multiplied. So we can go four times three times two and we can say 24 different toys. Same answer, much shorter. Why did I do the tree diagram? To prove that the fundamental counting principle works and not that you guys are just completely trust me. There's no trust, Chef. Why? Why is that? Okay? Make sense? And we're flip over. So here we have a school cafeteria. It, is, um, it offers sandwiches made with fillings. There's fillings of ham, salami, cheese, or egg. And if I have a highlighter, I'd be highlighting. Because highlighting in math or underlining is very important. Because that's how you don't miss things. Remember, 30% procedural, the rest you're working through conceptual or problem solving makes it a lot more thought process put in. So we have fillings of ham, salami, cheese, or egg on white, whole wheat, or rye bread. Now remember, in order to use the fundamental counting principle, we have to have parts that make the whole, but we can only be choosing one option. So for example, if they wanted me to pick two fillings, two types of filling, like ham and salami or something would be allowed, I can't use the fundamental counting principle. It has to only be one option to pick. Okay? So let's keep reading to see if we can use it. How many different sandwiches can be made using only one filling and one type of bread? So I can use fundamental counting principle. I can only have one filling and one type of bread. Do you agree? If it's more than one filling, I can't use this. We lose a, we learn a different method. Okay? So how many parts are there to this sandwich? There's two. Exactly. So there's part one, which is the filling. And, which we multiplied, part two, which is the bread. Okay. Remember the blanks mean I'm choosing one of that, correct? So I'm choosing one filling 
and one type of bread. What goes above the line? The number of? Yeah, options. How many options, right? So how many go above filling? What number goes above filling? Four. Does that mean I'm choosing four of them? No, the blank means I'm choosing one from four. We agree? Then this bread blank means I'm choosing one from how many? Three. So how many different sandwiches can we make? Twelve. Okay, the next one, we have a math 30 quiz. It consists of eight multiple choice questions. So if I walked up to this test, and you have to think sometimes, right? Like, okay, the, it's, the words are weird. Like, that's what I was thinking. And when I, when I looked at anything that was like a word problem, I would just shut down in high school. I'd be like, I'm good. I'll just do all the easy ones. And then these word problems, I'll just wing, which is not a good thing to do. Because, like I said, 60% of, 60 to 70% of your test is conceptual and problems. Right? So let's let's think about this. So I have a math 30 quiz. It has eight multiple choice questions. So if I went up to you and I said, okay, you have a math 30 quiz and it has eight multiple choice questions, I'd say, how many parts are there to this test? How many parts do you have to do to finish this test? Parts could be questions. How many do I have to do to finish this test? Eight. Am I allowed to pick one or two of them or do I have to do all eight? You have to do all eight questions, correct? On a test, if you had eight multiple choice, you have to do eight questions. You don't get to like choose two if you only like two. Okay? So how many parts are there to this test? People will say, well, multiple choice is one part, numeric response is another part, and written. No. How many different things do you have to do? You have to do eight different questions, right? They're all different. They're not the same question, right? Yes, they're multiple choice, but they look totally different. So how many blanks do we have? Eight. We have number one, question number one. Question number two, question number three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Do we have to do all of the questions or can we just pick or choose which ones we feel the need to do? All of them or pick or choose? All of them. So I need to do number one and number two and number three and number four and number five and number six. So what am I going to do between them? What operation with and? Multiply, right? Because and and add don't go together. They look similar, they do not go together. So if I say and, I have to do this one, and this one, and this one, and you multiply. It's very important because you guys will not put these dots. You'll just fly through and multiply them without showing the dots. And the dots is mathematics. The dots show that you're actually multiplying that, correct? So make sure you have those dots there. All right, let's keep reading. So it consists of eight multiple choice questions. Each question has four choices, A, B, C, or D. How many different number sets are possible? Answer sets. So how many options do I have for number one? Four, and I'm choosing one option, A, B, C, or D, correct? Because you don't get to pick like two. B and C aren't both correct. Yeah. Number two I have? Four. Four and three and four and five, six, seven, and eight, which is four to the power of eight, which I think is six, five, five, two, six. Just did it last class. Okay, how can I ask this question in a different way? You're not writing anything, you're just thinking you're gonna discuss. Okay? So how they can ask this question in a bit of a different way is this. You're not writing anything, you're just thinking about it. This is left has an answer key. Okay. I have an answer key on my desk. Do you agree? Eight answers, eight questions. Yeah? A, B, B, C, D, D, whatever. Eight answers, many questions. Yeah? And I'm clumsy and I smack my coffee and it spills on my answer key. Okay? When it spills on my answer key, it washes away the last six answers. So the first two still exist, right? On that answer key in front of me. How many different answer keys could there be? 
I have eight questions. Copy, fills, washes away the last six, right? First two still there. How many different answer keys can I have? Discuss it. You think about so some people see this as an eight question question still eight question answer sheet some people say well two of them are filled it's a six question answer sheet either way you get the same answer so if it's still an eight question answer sheet which it technically still is. I have numbers one to eight, right? Just the answers washed away. I would have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, how many answers would I have options for number one? One, whatever the heck the answer was. It's still there. It's A, it's B, it's C, or it's D, right? It didn't go away. I had one option for it. Yeah? What about number two? One. It's whatever it is, A, B, C, or D. What happens though with three to eight? We're back to how many options? Four. We're back to four again because we don't know what the options are. So we have those four. So some people look at it as now only a six question and they go four to the power of six and don't put the one in the one because they're like, we don't care about those. That answer key's done. We can't do that. Or look at the eight and it's one and one. Does that make sense? So this one would be four to the six. All right. Um, I always remember this car question or one like it when I was in grade 12 because I didn't understand it. I was a bit of a disaster and I couldn't fill in the blanks for all of them um, because I thought of it in a different way. So here we have, in how many ways can five different models of black cars? Now, the key thing here is the different models because if I have five black cars that are painted the exact same, but they're a different model, can you tell them apart? Like one is like a Mustang and one is a Grand Dodge Grand Caravan and they're painted the exact same black. Can you tell them apart? Yeah, they look different. Touch and go, but you can kind of tell them apart. You know what I mean? And then you have four different models of red cars. So yes, they can paint the exact same red, but you can tell them apart because they're different models. Do you agree? Okay. Now, let's keep reading. So here it says, they're parked next to each other in a parking garage. So guys, how many parking spots are there? Five. How many cars are there? Also there. There's nine. How many parking spots do I need if I want to park them next to each other? Nine, nine right? So how many parts are there to this parking garage? Nine blanks. We agree? Where we're going to put a car in each. Yeah? Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Are we parking all the cars or are we parking only some of them? All of them. So we need this one and this one and this one and this one parked, correct? So that's where we get the multiplication. Now up here it says fundamental counting principle involving restriction. So it says when solving problems involving restrictions, it's important that the restriction is dealt with first. What is the restriction? Well, the restriction is if it says like something has to be here or something has to be here. Okay, you have to deal with those first. So let's keep reading. It says, can we park next to each other in a parking garage if a black car must be first? So I need a black car first. And a red car must be last. So a black car must be first, a red car must be last. There's no specifications on the other cars, right? They can be whatever. So I have to deal with that first because those are the restrictions. So, what does this line mean? How many are parked here? How many cars are we parking there? Yeah, how many options, I guess, should we do we have? We have one car parked here. How many options? Five. I reverted it to get you guys the other answer, and then you gave me the other answer. Um, so, there's five cars that can be parked there. Five options, correct? Crystal in high school, so could, I could do that. I could put the five there. I was fine. So then I was like, okay, well, there's five cars parked there. Does that actually mean that there are five cars parked there? No, you're like, you're stupid, Crystal. Yeah, I was. It's fine. And some of you were in the same boat as me and thinking, well, I think there's five cars parked there. There's not five cars parked there. There is one, because this is how many, it's a parking spot that holds how many cars? One. It holds one car there. We agree? 
There's just five options of cards that I can put there, right? Totally different. Okay, in that last blank, how many cards can I park there? How many options, sorry? I have four options. How many cards can I park there? One. I have four options of cards I can park there, but I'm only going to park one of them. We agree? So I would be stuck and I'd be like, well, now I've parked all nine cars. I have no numbers to put in the middle. No joke. That's how I was. And some of you were thinking that. And you're like, yeah, I agree with you. Um, we haven't parked nine cars. We've potentially used nine options of cars, but how many cars have we actually only parked? We parked two cars. We agree? I have five options here. I parked one of the black cars. I have four options of red. I parked one of the red cars. I parked two cars. So I can go to any blank now and say, how many options do I, but I always do sequential, so I'm going to start at the far left. How many options of cars can I park in that blank? Seven, because I parked two of how many? Nine, we agree. So I have seven options left for here, because they could be red or black, it doesn't matter, but there are seven left. Does that make sense? Parked one in the first blank, parked one in the second blank. I have seven of nine cars left for this blank. Yes? Now I park one of them. So how many do I have for the next blank? Six. Now I'm going to park a car there. So how many options do I have left for this one? Five. Park a car here that I'm going to have. Four. Park a car here. Three. Park a car here. Two. Park a car here. One. Now, pencils down so you can listen. That's going to be really super cool. So, Five times four, I could just go five times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one times four. I could do that. Or I can actually go five times four is 20 times, now uh, there's called an exclamation mark, an exclamation point in um, English. And it means you're like screaming something like help or something like that, exclamation, right? Exclamation mark in mathematics is called factorial. And you use it when you started a number and rock account. So if I look at these ones here, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off. If I can say blast off, I can use the factorial symbol. So it's a kindergarten counting, right? You go down by one all the way to one. So if I can go seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off, I can actually go seven factorial into my calculator and it will do the math for me. It'll be put, it will put in 7 times 7, 5, 4, 3, 2, 2, 1, the answer to that for me. So let's try it out. I'm going to show you where it is in your calculator. So you're going to go 20 times 7. You go 20 times 7, and then you're going to press the math button. The math button is on the top left. It's a couple down. Press the math button. Then you're going to arrow over to probability. So math, arrow over to probability. Remember, you can't have pulls out. You're testing it. Don't even try. Okay. So we go 20 times 7, and then math, you arrow to the left or arrow to the right to PRB, which is probability along the top. And you pick number 4. So 20 times math, or 20 times 7, then math, and arrow to probability. Number four, enter. You guys hit it? It should be 100,800. 100,800. And if I go five times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one times four, I get the same answer. Same thing. Okay? Makes sense? So if ever you can count down to one and say blast off, you can use the factorial symbol. So if I did. Uh, 99 factorial, that would be 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 times blah, 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 times 2 times 1 times blast, right? All the way to 1, going down by 1. So that's when you can use that factorial symbol. All right?